Thank you, Carl. All right, so this next guest I have to give some special thanks for. Um, actually, during the lunch break, uh, Dash just sponsored Unsung to deliver 118 meals to people out here in Miami. So I'd like to give a warm welcome to Ryan Taylor, the director of finance at Dash. So let's Hi, everyone. I'm Ryan Taylor. I'm director of finance at Dash, uh, a cryptocurrency that was forked from Bitcoin three years ago. In fact, today is our third birthday, so happy birthday, Dash. Happy birthday, Dash. Yeah. So, um, I'm obviously here to talk about Dash, but I also want to talk to you about the adoption of cryptocurrency and why we haven't seen the widespread adoption of cryptocurrencies in general. Um, before I do that, I, I'm sure many of you have heard of Dash. Uh, many of you may actually associate us with uh, a privacy centric coin, um, especially since we changed our name from Darkcoin two years ago. If you haven't kept up with the project over the course of the last couple of years, I would say that there is a lot to catch up with. Um, we have been working hard on a number of different improvements, and you'll see that we're so much more than simply one feature. And so with that, I'll, uh, I'll get started. So I spend a lot of time thinking about, well, why are we not seeing greater adoption of this great technology? And people fancy about a, a bunch of different reasons why. Um, and I actually don't think that any of these are likely to be the culprits. You hear everything from image problems like Mount Gox and, and associations with Silk Road down to just ignorance. If people just understood how wonderful this technology is, surely they would use it. But I think that there's actually two main reasons why we're not seeing widespread use of cryptocurrencies. The first is, all cryptocurrencies face this chicken and egg problem. Merchants don't want to accept a form of payment that very few customers use, and customers don't want to use a payment system that hardly anybody takes. And on the surface, it seems like a really hard problem to solve, and, and it is. But it has been solved before, and it's been solved before in financial services many times. So I think it's a wise idea to look at, well, what are those adoption factors and how do we stack up against them? And the proven solution to the chicken and egg problem is the following. You need payments that are faster, easier, and more secure than the alternatives, and you need to provide switching incentives. And you usually do this within a confined ecosystem. And if you look at examples of this, starting with credit cards, credit cards were faster, easier, and more secure than paying with a check or cash handling costs. They did it by incentivizing switching, by providing customers with grace periods and these addicting miles that we all have and use. PayPal did it online by providing a faster, easier, and more secure way to pay within a defined ecosystem of ePay. And it was better than sending checks through the mail or, at the time, typing in your credit card information online. That was a scary deal. And they provided switching incentives. $20 sign-up fee, I was one of those people. Free person-to-person -person transfers, they deliver real value to the customer. So how does cryptocurrency stack up against these criteria? Well, Bitcoin and virtually every other cryptocurrency uses long cryptographic addresses, takes 10 minutes to confirm. There's no recourse if you make a purchase and the, the merchant doesn't deliver. And it's one of the only payment systems in the world where the consumer who hates paying fees to spend their money is the one responsible for the fees. On all three dimensions, we're falling short. And so it's no wonder that consumers have not adopted cryptocurrency. These are the rules, and we're breaking them. And I also think that the second issue is just usability. If you look at the early internet, this is the first browser, dominated by text and hyperlinks, maybe a couple of pictures. Compare that with the internet of today. It's rich, interactive, customized to you. And we would never go back and switch to that picture on the left once we've experienced this. 
almost every cryptocurrency wallet looks something like this. And I don't know about you, but I think it looks a lot like that. It's not a rich experience. It doesn't deliver information that's relevant to me. I have to wait for the blockchain to sync before I can use it. Unless I want to use a centralized service where I hand my Bitcoins off to somebody else, this is my experience. And it's a pretty bad one. We're eight years in. The question is, what is this going to look like in the future? It isn't that. I promise you. T and M Lax, this is a design firm. Back in 2006, they recognized that the internet was beginning to change. Between 2002 and 2006, you started to see functional design enter into the marketplace. And they have a hypothesis that if they invested in companies that would focus on the user experience, those companies would outperform. They picked 10 companies that they thought delivered great user experiences. And they're not all online companies. You've got an apparel company, you've got an airline, an insurance company, and a brick and mortar retailer. This doesn't sound like a great investment uh, thesis on the surface, knowing what's happened since, but Here's what actually happened, and by the way, this is a time when there were no iPhones, there were no Google Maps, there were no Google Docs, the number one social networking site was MySpace. There was no way that they could know that all of that was going to happen, but here's what did. Over the next 10 years, 500% return. Five times what the market delivered. And so user experience matters and we're not delivering it as an industry. So what is Dash doing differently? How are we addressing this problem? We're creating a cryptocurrency that has instant transactions, that will send your shipping information through the network with the press of your thumbprint to your thumbprint reader and authorize the payments so it's faster and easier to use. We're making it more secure with introducing vault accounts we already have balance and transaction privacy, and we're introducing purchase protection. So we're addressing those two, as well as providing some switching incentives, loyalty programs that we'll be rolling out, interest-bearing accounts, and free transfers for people who are transferring person to person. And we're doing it in a way that delivers a design experience that is consistent with other services. PayPal does a wonderful job of this. Uh, and their subsidiary Venmo. Uh, if you're a millennial, chances are you have this in your pocket. These are the types of experiences that we want to create. And in order to do that, cryptocurrency requires a re-architecture and a massive one. So we've been working on it for the last couple of years already. Uh, in our first phase, we delivered a couple high-value features, instant transactions and privacy features. In order to do so, we developed a new uh, layer to our network called Masternodes that deliver these services to our, our users. We introduced governance and uh, a funding model that allows us to be sustainable. This is not an ICO. Our funding is continuous and it's paid for by transaction fees and uh, by uh, block reward. And we're introducing a number of firsts here on February 5th that are technical foundational elements required to deliver the type of experience that we've defined. We're introducing the first decentralized object-oriented relational database. That's a lot of technical terms. But trust me, this was a lot of work. This is going to allow our network to serve up content very, very quickly to our customers. We're introducing Watchdog, which is the first proof of service implementation. And we're introducing Sentinel, which is a programmable object-oriented governance system that will allow us to scale and create new ways of resolving questions on the network, funding ourselves, etc. And we're about to enter phase three. We've actually been working on it for quite some time. These are all the end user, user features. Um, you'll be able to log in with the username and password. You'll be able to have full remote access from any device. It's no longer a wallet on a device. It is an account that you can access from your tablet, phone, and desktop. 
We're introducing a merchant marketplace to help bring consumers and merchants together, help them find each other and engage in commerce. And we're introducing the first decentralized API. This will be a way that merchants can integrate with the network as simply as copying and pasting a snippet of code into their checkout screen. And we're also doing security enhancements, which I've talked about a little bit, but uh, ways to protect the consumer from theft and from uh, purchases. And this is what evolution is going to look like. Uh, it's going to be very familiar to you. You're going to be able to create a content, contact list of your friends, favorite stores that you interact with. Sign up for uh, uh, subscriptions that debit your account automatically and uh, see all of your information in a very clean format. We're going to have a consistent user experience on our desktop here. And all the information that we want, none of the information that we don't. How are we doing this? Well, like I said, we have the first decentralized governance system. We spend a lot of time creating this because we recognize that in virtually all other cryptocurrencies, 100% of the block reward goes towards mining. Why is that when mining is only one need of a network? Don't we also need developers? Don't we need uh, marketing? Don't we need support? What about a call center where customers can call in and get help? So we allocate only 45% of our block reward to miners. We allocate another 45% towards infrastructure. These are the nodes on the network that provide full copies of the blockchain so that we have a robust uh, uh, network that's high speed. And then 10% is set aside for what we call treasury. And this is anything else that the network needs, including being here at this conference. And at this point, our current size, our annualized funding is now over $1.2 million. And to put that in perspective, that's about three times what the Bitcoin Foundation is. We're developing code faster, and as we grow, we get more and more resources to do so. And if we ever were to reach Bitcoin's market cap, this funding would become $170 million. And I can't wait for that Super Bowl. We're allocating those resources through a decentralized governance model. Anyone who starts a master node, only prerequisite being putting up a thousand dash, uh, can start up a master node and can vote. These are people who are staked in the outcome of our network. They're the ones who decide uh, how those funds get spent. So we're the first decentralized autonomous organization. Probably haven't heard of it because we don't have problems that make the news. It's been functioning since 2015, and the growth has been astounding. These are the integrations and partnerships that we signed up in 2016 alone. I'm not going to go through the list, but another interesting one here is Hearst says, we are the number one altcoin used for actual payments of things that people buy on Amazon. And that speaks to the usefulness of what we're creating. In terms of our market cap, Dash has grown at a phenomenal pace. We have outgrown Bitcoin by at least double the, the, the rate and the entire altcoin space every single year, and we're on pace to do it again this year. Our key performance indicators are off the chart. Our daily trading volume is up 1,700% quarter uh, year on year in the last quarter, and this quarter it's up another four times from the previous quarter. We're beginning to receive a lot of, of uh, attention on the project. In fact, if you look back at the last 24 months, there are only four points that have consistently remained in the top 10. There's been a lot of hypes, a lot of ones that show up and go away. But those are Bitcoin, Ripple, Litecoin, and Dash. That's it. You see a lot of other kinds come and go, but we are consistently delivering new innovations and we're consistently being rewarded for it. The question that I get all the time is, well, this all sounds great, 
but aren't the network effects of the market leaders insurmountable? And my response to that is absolutely not. Um, even if you look at markets where network effects are extremely strong, history would suggest otherwise. If you look at Betamax versus VHS, Betamax was first market by two years. It had better picture quality, better sound, and better image stability. But VHS came along with the one feature people actually cared about. They delivered two to four hour report times. Now you could actually report the baseball game or not switch the movie out uh, when you're watching a long movie. In the financial services space, Diners Club was first to market by eight years over Visa. Bank of America uh, launched the Bank of America card, which was the precursor to Visa, in Fresno, California, a concentrated market. Uh, and they focused on a general purpose card, whereas Diners Club had been focusing on exclusive diners in major US cities. And so they went about it in a different way, and they said, you know, people don't like carrying around all of these different store cards. We're going to create a general purpose card, and we're going to find a way to reach penetration. And so history really does suggest that there are ways to overcome those network effects. I would argue that this market is likely to end up being more like Visa, MasterCard, American Express. I think we're going to see multiple blockchains really come to, to dominate this space with different use cases and different um, priorities in terms of what they're, they're optimizing for for their customers. And even so, what are network effects? Well, network effects are nothing more than positive feedback loops. The more merchants you get, the more customers you get, and vice versa. We've designed our entire system to have a lot of network effects. And I'm not going to walk you through this whole slide, but the one that I would focus you on is our budget system. And this is really illustrated by the investments that we made. They build our ecosystem out. And as our ecosystem gets out, built out and becomes more useful to our users, we attract more capital. And as we attract more capital, our budget goes up. And these have other effects that feed out into other areas around our performance and delivery and our focus on the customer. And I think that this is one of the most powerful things that we have going for us. So what's next for Dash? Well, we're going to be the first, I think, cryptocurrency to have corporate offices. We're moving into our corporate offices at Arizona State University's Skysong Innovation Center on February 1st. I'm very excited. <laughs> on February 5th, we're rolling out Sentinel, which has those features that I talked about earlier, foundational elements that we need to deliver on uh, our, our uh, long-term vision. We're integrating with Wall of Coins, which will allow uh, users to purchase Dash with cash at 120,000 locations in the US, plus 11 other countries. We're going to be hosting our Q4 and end-of-year conference call on February 16th. I also believe we're the only cryptocurrency to hold a quarterly conference call for our investors. We're very transparent about our funds, how they're being used, what our plans are, and we invite you to, to join us and learn more. And then, of course, Dash Evolution. We'll have an alpha release out mid this year, and we're aiming to complete it by the end of the year for public release. And I got to tell you, I, I quit a, an amazing job with one of the hardest to get into with hedge funds on Wall Street to come join the team here because I really believe in this project. And I believe that its potential is unbelievable. And uh, so I invite you to come learn more at dash.org. Stop by our booth. I'll be there answering questions. And thank you for listening.